for this Easter day and the years to come. You are listening to His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I, Emperor of Ethiopia, commenting on past incidents in his life. I am Oswald Hoffman. In a few moments, I'll share with you an interview I was privileged to conduct with this great man, who is known throughout the world as a leader and statesman. Yet even beyond that, His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I is a devout Christian, the emperor of a country with a rich culture and nearly 1,600 years of Christian tradition, some of which centers around the celebration of Christmas. But I'm getting ahead of myself, for here now is a different side of the Christmas story. Christ lives in the life of a man and a nation, His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I, Emperor of Ethiopia. Christ to the nations, the Lutheran hour. His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I is the 225th reigning monarch of Ethiopia, a descendant of the line which is said to have had its origins in the union of King Solomon of Israel and the Queen of Sheba celebrated in Ethiopian folklore and preserved in the imperial coat of arms. The seal of the House of David, Solomon's father, is there, but not by itself. The cross of Christ, combined with David's emblem, points back to the time when Christianity came to Ethiopia in the 4th century A.D., and to the force which Ethiopia's Coptic Christian tradition has exerted to bind her people together and to shape her culture. Music like that of the car, which you hear in the background, a four-stringed instrument plucked with the fingers, remains in use to this day. And the countryside is dotted with churches centuries old, many of them carved out of solid rock. It is to Ethiopia itself, and to this Christian tradition, that we want to introduce you today, as the Lutheran Layman's League presents a special program on the celebration of Christmas in Ethiopia featuring an interview with His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I, Emperor of Ethiopia. Addis Ababa, Ethiopia's capital city, means new flower in Amharic, Ethiopia's official language. The city is aptly named. Less than 80 years old, it grew up in Ethiopia's central highlands to a present-day population of nearly 500,000. I talked with Emperor Haile Selassie in his private office in Jubilee Palace, built in 1955 in the southeast part of Addis Ababa, to commemorate the 25th anniversary of His Imperial Majesty's reign. Although Emperor Haile Selassie speaks excellent English, which is Ethiopia's second language, he answered my questions in Amharic, since state protocol requires him to conduct all official business in the official language. Our first interpreter is Dr. Manasi Haile, Ethiopia's Minister of Information and Tourism. In the background, you can hear children playing in the courtyard of the palace. Your Imperial Majesty, it is a great honor to be permitted to speak with you today and also to have you as a guest on this special Christmas program, which will be broadcast to people all over the world. Your Imperial Majesty, what is it that makes you want to follow Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ was in the Catalan Medellin when Jesus Christ was born from Virgin Mary. From that time on, he lived an exemplary life. A life which men everywhere must emulate. This life 
and the faith that he has taught us assures us of salvation, assures us also of harmony and good life upon earth. Because of the exemplary character of the life of Jesus Christ, it is necessary that all men do their maximum in their human efforts to see to it that they approximate as much as they can the good example that has been set by him. It's quite true that there is no perfection in humanity. From time to time, we make mistakes. We do commit sins. But even as we do that, deep in our hearts as Christians, we know we have a chance of forgiveness from the Almighty. He told us that all men are equal, regardless of sex, their national origin and tribe. And he also taught us, all who seek him shall find him. To live in this healthy life, a Christian life, is what makes me follow Jesus Christ. Imperial Majesty, what advice would you give a person who is considering the claims of Christ, perhaps for the first time? I would tell a person that's considering the claim of Christ uh, for the first time that it is necessary to have faith in the Almighty, that it's necessary to have love, and that it's necessary to conduct oneself in a manner that we have been taught to do in the Bible. I would advise him to read and to study the Bible. I would also advise him to seek secular knowledge. For the one, the more one knows, the more he realizes the need for a prime mover, the need for a creator, a creator who is good, and the need for salvation and also for peaceful life on earth. I will also tell him to learn and to think for himself the ways he would serve the Lord. In this thought and in this understanding of this, he will inevitably find the way of serving his fellow men. For his faith would then be manifested by his conduct. If Christians behave in this way, if we dedicate ourselves to this fundamental task, then we will have a peaceful world and will be assured of not transgressing against uh, the will and the commandments of God. Your Imperial Majesty, are there any incidents in your life which stand in your memory as times when faith in Christ Sustained you. There are many instances in my life where times of trouble and difficulties. No matter what may befall a human being. No. He can always succeed in overcoming it in time if he, have the, he has the strength of faith and praise to God. For inevitably, he comes to the assistance of those that believe in him and those that through their work live an exemplary life. This goes not only for Christians in my view, but for all men. I think God commiserates with those uh, that find themselves in misfortune. In particular, when my country, Ethiopia, was invaded by alien forces several years ago, I was sustained in that period by my faith in God and in the abiding belief that justice, however it may take time, will ultimately prevail. If I did not have faith in the Almighty,
righteousness and that justice inevitably prevails, then I would have lost hope and that thus the interest of my country would have been ignored. Because I attempted to maintain my faith in him and because all Ethiopians maintained their faith in the ultimate goodness of the world and then the design, grand design that the Almighty has for all men in the world, we were able to victoriously re-enter our country and rid ourselves of evil, evil forces. If I did not have in my heart the love of God, I don't think I would have acted in a manner that I did. The love of God brings a sense of religiousness in a human being. It gives him comfort for the future and assurance that right causes will ultimately prevail. His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I ascended the throne of Ethiopia in November 1930. Now in this year, 1968, Haile Selassie has been in the forefront in mediating the crisis in Biafra. Some of the intervening years have been stormy ones. But there are few statesmen who can retrace a career of more resolute leadership in both internal and world affairs. Few can claim greater unbroken continuity with the past that nevertheless moves methodically into the 20th century. At the same time, few have seen more anguish and defeat than Haile Selassie, of whom biographer Leonard Mosley has written in projected epitaph, he shaped rather than waited upon events. Just seven months after he became emperor in 1930, Haile Selassie gave the people of Ethiopia their first written constitution. His plea before the League of Nations in 1936, as his country was ravaged by Mussolini's armies, and his anguished exile during the following years, are etched in the memory of the world. When he regained his throne in 1941, his refusal to allow retaliation against the defeated invader was viewed with disbelief. On this day, he said, I owe thanks unutterable by the mouth of man to the loving God who has enabled me to be present among you. Today is the beginning of a new era in the history of Ethiopia. Since this is so, do not reward evil for evil. Do not commit any act of cruelty like those which the enemy committed against us up to this present time. When the United Nations Charter was drawn up after World War II, His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie was one of its original drafters. In 1963, he established the Organization of African Unity to encourage cooperation among African states and to coordinate their efforts to build a better life for all the peoples of Africa. Constitutional reforms in 1956 guaranteed all the rights of the people of Ethiopia though the emperor retains much personal power in governing his agricultural nation of 22 million people, all the time seeking to lead his nation toward a fully modern way of life. At 76 years of age, his imperial majesty continues to work a 20-hour day with three hours for sleep and one devoted to prayer. Emperor Haile Selassie and I talked about many things on that day during the rainy season. You can even hear it thunder once or twice. Our English interpreter for the remainder of the interview is Otto Menker Esaias. Otto, by the way, is the Ethiopian equivalent for Mr. Otto Menker is editor of medium wave programs at Radio Voice of the Gospel, operated at Addis Ababa by the Lutheran World Federation. Imperial Majesty, how does it seem to you the Apostle Paul meant the statement, faith works by love? What St. Paul said here is not a mistaken statement. You all know what St. Paul was and what kind of work he was engaged in before his conversion. Later on, after his conversion, he had faith and love, and if he had not had that, he would not have taught people this in his epistles. Neither love nor faith are separable from each other. 
An elaboration of this is Paul's exposition in one of his epistles, which speaks of love and faith. Without love, all of our human efforts in the sight of God can be useless. He loved us, and on our behalf, he was given as a ransom, and it was because of love and his love for us that he accomplished the act of love. Your Imperial Majesty, as a member of the body of Christ, what do you expect of the church? The church is not merely a building. The church is the faithful fulfillment of the Christian life and its requirements. Thus, as the name applies to the building, so is our heart, the church in which God dwells. After our blameless Creator was sent to this world by His Father, then the hearts of all believers became the temple of God. The love of Christ cannot be fathomed by a series of questions and answers, and man's soul cannot experience deeper enrichment as a result. We believe that man can at all times be bound by his love and grace. Your Imperial Majesty, as a member of the body of Christ, what do you feel you can contribute to the life of the church? <laughs> All men are endowed with natural responsibility. This responsibility is in turn distributed and delegated to all according to his gift, and it is expected of each one to fulfill his responsibility. This responsibility in turn is to God, and thus, for example, one would start his working by asking God to bless the beginning and thank God for a good ending too. We believe that all people, in all of their responsibilities delegated to them, will begin and finish their work in God's name. I give you a brief answer. If we go on into details, we would have to spend a long time discussing. It is a magnificent answer. And, uh, I am deeply grateful for it. To turn to another subject, Your Imperial Majesty, are there any passages of the Bible that have become especially meaningful to you? I have the highest respect for the Bible as a whole. We also recognize the rightful name the Bible bears. We find that in all the periods of the Old Testament, in the time of patriarchs, kings and prophets, great miracles were done. On the other hand, the New Testament in which our Lord himself gave the command to go to all the world and to preach is also of high value. Then Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the four Gospels in which the sayings of our Lord are recorded, are pillars for all men on the earth. Therefore, the Bible should not be cut into portions. Imperial Majesty, as a mature Christian, have you a special word for young people of these days? On this occasion, I address also all those within our empire. Our Christianity is not restricted to a given church and I stress above all that we do not wish to make distinctions. My advice to all is to fulfill the Ten Commandments. You are aware of the contents of the Ten Commandments and can elaborate on it. If the nation for which I am the Emperor follows and accepts this, since it's also what I accept and follow, I would believe our country is not only historically Christian, but also actively Christian. Imperial Majesty, the birthday of our Lord is observed by people throughout the world in various ways, I know. And I should like to ask you how you observe the feast of the Nativity of our Lord 
within your own family and household. The birth of our Lord is a joyous family event. However, I do not only rejoice with my immediate family, since the whole Ethiopian nation is my family. I say this in the context of Christmas being observed by all churches in Ethiopia. I rejoice on this occasion also because of Jesus Christ being given for us. For he was born in the lonely place and got warm by animals. This fact encourages us to celebrate it with joy. When I have visited the five large continents, I have not been anywhere where there was not a church. All over the world, I have come to know that the birth of Jesus Christ is celebrated. Drums, chanting and solemn dancing are the beginning of the celebration of Gena, Ethiopian Christmas, which falls on January 7th according to our reckoning of time. In Ethiopia, however, this is Christmas, 1960, rather than 1968. Ethiopians follow the Julian calendar, you see, which has 13 months, and their numbering of years differs from ours by eight years. The name Gena, incidentally, comes from the game which the men play only once each year, on Christmas Day. The celebration begins early, about three o'clock in the morning of Gena. Special services take place in all the churches of Ethiopia, though most people in Addis Ababa attend the observance in the Church of the Nativity or a Trinity Church. Priests dressed in colorful vestments and members of their congregations join in the Malat, a lively hymn sung in Ga'az, an old Ethiopian language preserved in the church's liturgy. After a sermon, the priests move outside to the church ground some carrying huge drums and other musical instruments, which they play in rhythm as the priests stand in two long rows facing each other. Others carry slender poles topped with Coptic crosses, making graceful movements with them as they step back and forth in a rhythmical dance. A poet has prepared a short poem for the day, and a soloist weaves it into a melody as the poet recites it. The remainder of the day is spent feasting, visiting friends, and in celebration, while the younger men flock to the field where the teams are forming for the once a year game of Gena. <laughs> the game of Gena is something like hockey. Only a wooden ball is used, and clubs are made of dried tree branches. There's no limit to the number of players on each side, and they have quite a time of it. The men divide into two groups, and each tries to drive the ball to the opposite half of the field. The chanting and the rhythm of the clashing sticks are punctuated by shouts of derision directed against the other team, and they are not always in the kindest of terms. Still, the game goes on, rough as it is, and no one complains. It continues until sunset. The winning team goes from house to house where they are offered food and drink, and the merrymaking goes on well into the night. They will retain the championship until next year at the same time. Yet beneath all the festivities, there is something elusive, something very profound. And so I had one more question for His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I, a question about the meaning of Christmas in a world of many creeds and also in his own land where nearly 70 languages are spoken and where Islam and various forms of tribal religion exist side by side with Christianity. But before that, I think you'll be as captivated as I was by the young voices of the student choir of the Haile Selassie I Foundation School for the Blind in this Christmas carol sung in Amharic, A Child is Born in Bethlehem.
Father is God on high. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As I said before, the birth of Christ is celebrated all over the world. When I say in the whole world, it does not mean that all people would observe it in the same manner. In all the places that I have visited, including the Muslim and the Buddhists, we have seen the observance. But for Christians, it is an act conducted with love. Your Imperial Majesty, you have done us great honor, and also all the people who will listen to this broadcast by giving us the opportunity to speak with you this day. And all those who are listening should know that this conversation was held in the Imperial Palace at Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, with His Imperial Majesty, the Emperor of Ethiopia, Ali Selassie I, and we thank you and wish you God's blessing in all the days to come. Thank you. For Christians, the celebration of Christmas is indeed an act conducted with love. The love of God reaches down and reaches out to everyone through the child born in Bethlehem, Jesus Christ, whom the Apostle John calls God's Word made flesh, a word of life and love straight from God to you and me. To this love of God, Christians respond with love, love that reaches out toward God and toward other men. This love of Christ his love for us and our love for him is the very source of Christian conduct. And this is the way it works. If one man died for all men, then in a sense, all died. And his purpose in dying for them is that their lives should no longer be lived for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. If a man is in Christ, he becomes a new person altogether. The past is finished and gone, and everything has become new and fresh. Christmas was God's idea, God's doing. God in Christ, that's what makes Christmas real. In Christ, God gave and God gives. In Christ, there is forgiveness and reconciliation with the good and giving God. In Christ, the great God shares his own rightness with men, transmitted with power to save men from the destiny toward which their sins are constantly driving them. In Christ, there is life, useful, fruitful, productive life. And so, we too can celebrate Christmas with love. The Lutheran Layman's League has presented this special Christmas broadcast featuring an interview with His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I, Emperor of Ethiopia. The interview was conducted by the Reverend Dr. Oswald Hoffman, 